give a note and then qualify it or, or bring it up everywhere, disclose it. See that you have you saved your skin as a professional to ensure that minimum disclosures are done. If it warrants a qualification, please qualify. If it warrants an attention is invited, please do that. If it does not uh, you know, warrant either, at least put it in your management letter so that tomorrow the management does not point fingers at you for uh, negligence. This is the next case. The debtor says that the year end was uh, 19 crore against sale of 25 crores. Sale is 25 crore, debtor is 19 crore. And then you go through the file, you see that there are huge disputes. Then you see that there are devolvement of LCs, so many things which are happening, but technically they are still managing to keep it afloat. Clear case. So what do we need to do? Go through the file, go through the financial statements. Do not rely only on the stock statements given by the company or, or some debtors and uh, you know uh, working capital statement given by the company. Go and understand. Please ensure that you tell them. They will not give you some time. They will say it is not available. No, what is this? It's a large company or it is a firm, whatever it may be, and uh, due date of filing is over, at least of the preceding year. They should give us. Insist on it and get it. When you insist, you will see that all the things which they said they cannot give you when you are putting a firm foot down and insisting, you will see all these things will start coming. Initially, they will say, no, what to do? Their accounts are a mess. It's not available. That's a standard answer which they will give you. But then, as you insist, you will start getting more and more documents. Now, a few examples of greening of bad accounts. Greening is, you know, doing something. I wouldn't say hanky-panky, but yeah, something close to that. You know, doing some little adjustment here and there with your ingenious thinking to ensure that it's, it's kept as, an, uh, as a performing asset. Check purchases, subsequent realization, um, isolated cash transaction. Each of these I will, I will give an example to, to, you know, make this more clear. Now, in this particular case, there was a check purchase rooted through a sister concern. The cash credit account has been brought within the limit on the last day by transfer from the current account of a sister concern. To enable this transfer, that itself is okay. If it is a transfer from a sister concern, that, to that extent we can still accept. But how did that happen? The, sis the sister concern got the money because the bank purchased a check. So it's almost like giving another ad hoc facility. You check purchase is equivalent to a new facility being given. So instead of giving it to the same account, you give a new facility to the sister concerns account by purchasing a check. You give them that money, sister concern brings it in. Then what happens? The document based on which that check was purchased and the check itself gets subsequently dishonored. In the, you know, few days later, if you look at that transaction, in the sister concerns books, you will see that this is what has happened. Is this an NPA? 100% it is an NPA. Can we see this on a routine, normal verification? No. Look at, looking at a account of this particular concern, you will see that before the end of the quarter, there is a credit. And all the norms are complied. 90-day norm, credits being higher than debits. We all know what the norms are. And in case we have any query, I'm sure the next session, this uh, eminent faculty will, will solve our queries on the norms. But then, norms can be important only up to a point. Beyond that, our professional instinct and our, uh, and our rational thinking will have to take over. So that's, it's only when we look at it from that angle will these things get unearthed. Again, this is another case of, this check purchase itself is a dangerous thing. My suggestion to you would be if in every bank when we do a branch bank audit, please ask for the check purchase account details. Have a look. So many frauds are happening from check purchase. Why should a bank purchase a check? Bank is purchasing a check because that party does not have the facility. That party does not have the limit. A party has a limit of only 1 crore. He wants another 25 lakhs. His limit is exhausted. OD has reached its maximum possible overdrawal. He needs more money. With the collusion of the manager, manager would say, okay, fine. If we if need to increase the limit, we'll have to go for center uh, approval from, uh, you know, GM, RO and all that. Your short-term problem, I'll solve it for you. And you buy 30 lakhs, 40 lakhs, you buy checks. And what happens with those checks? And that, that does not come into the party account. That's a separate ledger account, which is not mapped party-wise. You go to any bank and you will see, you will have to go and drill down into their accounts or finical to understand whose check it is. Otherwise, it will be just a running ledger. Check purchased, check purchased, date, 
some narration runs and whatever the data entry fellow wants to type will type some narration and there will be a value 20 lakh 30 lakh 5 crores we have seen check purchase of 4 or 5 crores one ship was purchased my friend here from private price that will remember a ship was purchased a substantially large one through check purchase mode multiple checks 67 crores imagine this is the quantum of uh, you know the, the frauds which are happening now are, are unimaginable. Isolated cash transactions for regularization. A term loan being serviced through cash. The moment you see that something is being regularized through cash, go all out and try and find out where this cash came from. Don't just accept a cash entry. Particularly for regularization if there is a cash entry. See how this cash has come. There is a way to do it. Go to the teller. There is a mechanism. I can't really, you know, each bank it varies. So you'll have to find out from the bank and the branch to see what is the route through which this cash has come. Can be established if sometimes. I can't, I'm not saying that it can be established all the time. But uh, we have been able to establish in several cases because we, we've drilled down and seen the, the whole trail of, of cash movement. Loans to associate concerns to regularize bad accounts routed through multiple branches. This is another thing. Sublimit multiple branches, sister concerns, ad hoc limits. Moment these things are all there. No, these are all not required. If it is a healthy balance sheet and if it is a, a healthy stock statement and uh, uh, you know or, or a healthy project for which term loan is given, if everything is healthy, they don't need these sublimits. They don't need to operate in multiple branches. Most of these large b banks which you are auditing today are on core banking. You take a facility in one, one branch and it can be, you know, facility can be drawn from any branch. Why do you need to open multi accounts in multiple or go for loan facilities from multiple branches? That, that, these are things which we need to look at. And in the same branch you will see that, you know, five, six, seven, eight sister concern ac accounts are there. I'm not saying I'm not finding fault with the sister concern or I'm not finding fault with, uh, with associate companies or subsidiary companies or any of that. That's not what I'm trying to say. But all of these need to be looked at. If an account is unhealthy, then you need to also look at it in tandem with the other accounts which are connected to it. And then you will see that you, if you cluster up all these together and if all of these were together one account, would this have been an NPA? And you will realize if, if the conclusion that comes is that it would have been an NPA, then you must go all out and try to convince the uh, branch and the top management. You can't obviously always convince the branch. That's something we need to be very clear about. No branch manager, because unfortunately today, incentives and everything is linked to performance at the branch level. You can't expect them to accept your, uh, your NPAs and all. But you will have to take a stand where you have to take a stand and report about it in case they are not going to sign. We've had so many situations where branch managers are not willing to sign their MOSI. So, okay, where is it said that branch manager has to sign their MOSI for their MOSI to be valid? It is our MOSI. We are signing off on their MOSI and we will give a note saying that the branch is not agreeing to this. Nevertheless, this MOC request to be passed. Simple. Don't go, I'm, again, I am not uh, saying that we need to go on a, on, on a confrontative basis where we are, you know, going and having a go at the branch and, you know, uh, getting into a major tussle with them from day one and, you know, no, no, uh, we are all peace-loving people, that's not the intention here, but if there is a professional disagreement and if it is being handled very unprofessionally by them, then there is nothing wrong with us being very aggressive about it and uh, at least escalating the issue to the next man, next level. And, uh, what can they do? At best, they will ensure that you don't get the branch audit next time. Big deal. Isn't that better than our whole certificate itself going? You know? Okay, I'll move on. This is another case. Sometimes you think that if it is an RTGS transfer, then everything is okay. Moment you see an RTGS entry in, in, this, uh, in, the, in the credit card, like, that's okay. We've heard even senior most bankers sometimes are like, wow, why are you questioning this? This is an RTGS entry. Just because it is an RTGS entry doesn't give it uh, any, any added credibility and all that. It's still just another transfer entry. It's only that it's more difficult for us to find the trail. That's the only difficulty. You know, sometimes to get hold of that RTGS trail is a little more difficult than, than the other regular uh, entries. But still, I would say it is easier to get the RTGS trail than, than the cash trail. Most difficult thing is to understand from where cash has come. RTGS is actually not all that dif difficult because again this is a case where we saw that, you know. This is routed through another bank 
So another facility given there, this bank money is given from here to that bank and that money gets rerouted back as an RTGS. And these things do happen. So let's keep our eyes and ears open wide alert. I'm just bringing out a few examples from a, from a practical sense which we have seen. And I would give about 70 to 80% of the credit for these observations to the youngsters there on the audit team who actually unearthed this. This is most of these are not found out when when we actually go to finalize and it's not that we are you know doing all this. It's all about giving the right instructions to our team, you know, which is why a seminar like the one which is being organized tomorrow is, is as important as this seminar is. Because they are our hands and legs and they are the ones who are going to actually go there and do this and they have more creativity and you know, so once they have fully understood that this is what you need to do. Trust me, they will have a, a more added enthusiasm and the kick of trying to find the fraud and all that. You know, if, if you've given them the right kind of orientation. So it's important that our audit team members are fully equipped and fully enthusiastic. They should be told that this is something really big. This is something really exciting. Next six, seven days are going to completely change your life. And you know, you need to work 12 hours a day, bring out the best and all. You give them the whole motivational bhashan and they will come out with everything. Trust me. You know, so just our side of it is to ensure that you know we give them that that orientation ad hoc facility the next case where ad hoc credit limits were seen granted to the borrowers at the period end which were renewed as ad hoc limits see if an ad hoc limit is given and it is again getting renewed also as an ad hoc limit then there's a problem again i'm not questioning ad hoc it can happen it happens it's allowed in banking thing but an ad hoc is given and a day it's given for 60 days at the end of the 60th day it is again renewed as an ad hoc it it's it's something which is tantamount to restructuring but kept out of the restructuring mold because of the way it has been captioned and all that. So we need to look at it from that angle. There is something wrong with that ad hoc limit. We need to go after it and then we may realize that that whole ad hoc limit itself should not have been given. They, they don't have the financial strength and their numbers don't have it. You know, you're given ad hoc normally for working capital related things. And then you, if you are not convinced, go down into their stock numbers and their debtors and do all the whole uh, the math and you will see that they don't have the drawing power to be eligible for this. And the, which means to say the ad hoc is in excess of DP and if a doc is in excess of DP for 90 days, classify it anyway. Sometimes you must use the norms to for our benefit. When we know that we are not able to, uh, you know, get the point home, sometimes we can definitely. That's where we must go to the norms. You know, the way I see it, norms are uh, can be interpreted by us to actually convince them about uh, certain things which are borderline. Which brings me to the point which I just started talking about: the importance of drawing power. Do we really understand the importance of drawing power? We as professionals, it is our duty to rework the DP. Let us not accept the DP which is given by the by the you know accountant of, of the you know of the company which is uh, being financed by the branch. Something is written, some random, sometimes in pencil and all that. Some statement come. They will say, "Oh, we've got oh, a huge DP, very very well in excess of margin." You will say. Then you take a look and you break down this whole DP and you look at it and vis-a-vis -vis the audited accounts and numbers and all, you will see that many a time it's in negative working capital itself where huge DP is shown in these statements. Immediately classify. Don't even give them an opportunity to go back and, and correct it and tell them nothing doing. You have given us a bogus document. That itself is a reason for us to believe that there is something wrong we are going to classify. That's it's certainly some degree of negotiation will happen. Finally, they will also try, they will bring the pressure from the management, all of that. But from the point of view of a, of a branch auditor, to the extent possible, please put an MOC for all these things you see. And if you are unable to or if, or if you are also not convinced or it could go both ways, at least kindly write that in your report. Let there be an audit, let there be an annexer to the audit report. Let there also be an annexure, a detailed annexer to the LFAR. Wherein, let's like like we do, let's assume we are doing an internal audit. Won't we write pages and pages of stories? Everything we see, everything that is likely to go wrong, all those things are included because we are also playing it safe and we also want to convince the management that we are doing a good job. It works the same. Everybody is looking at us. Bank manager may say, oh, thank you, you've done a wonderful job. The same bank manager will go and inform at the central office, these fellows have not done anything. There's nothing in the report. Useless exercise, they will go and report. But if imagine if you have a very detailed report covering everything, 
Now, irrespective of what the bank manager may say, they will look at it from that perspective. It's good. Auditor is good. He has a very good report. He has brought out so many observations. See. So at least write in that. It may not be practically possible to classify everything as NPA and all that, but at least bring out the issue so that it gets escalated. And even if at the branch level you and I cannot classify, at least the central auditor sitting somewhere else, at least he or she may be able to do our job for us. Yeah, so these are the important uh, you know, reasons or the importance of drawing power, which, are, which is there on the slide. I'm not reading this, but I'll again bring out a couple of examples. On, on that monitoring very very critical for from a DP perspective and just uh, a simple case now in this working which is which is there on the screen the bank share in drawing power they, the bank said it's only a mistake it's only a typing mistake but when we look at it the loan is about 11 and a half crores total DP is 22 crore and the bank share it's a consortium is uh, they are eligible only for 45 but in the working they have made it 54 and shown 12 so whose mistake is it it's the bank's mistake but is there collusion we don't know if there's collusion but to us it looks like there is collusion we are eligible only for nine crores and consistently the balance is above 11 crores immediately you said you have to classify nothing doing you have to classify there's no two ways about it so no, it's only a typing mistake you know we had informed the client and then they, they wouldn't have you know they would have always kept it below 10 it is our mistake what can we do? Our mistake or their mistake fact remains that the account is overdrawn. Classify. You know. This is another case. This working here. The book debts as per financials is only 123 crores. In our balance sheets in, in the old format it is uh, more than 6 months, less than 6 months is very very clearly there. And now they say as per their uh, DP statement given to us it's for the same period for the same date shows 180 lakhs. Which do we take? And they will say, no, sir, that is for their tax planning. They would have done something. Stocks may have been lower. Debts may have been low, lower. But what can we do? That Then they, it's like they are telling us that they, for uh, uh, the bank, you have one financials, and for the tax, you have another. And if you are given two, which do you accept? Obviously, you have to go with the signed numbers. You cannot say that, forget the signed balance sheet. We'll go with what is given to the bank. You cannot ignore that. Whether you classify it or not is different. Again, you may not be in a position to classify an account as NPA because of what I'm showing you here. But certainly you must report this. Report that we have seen this, that you know there is something, that we are, we are sensing that there is something wrong in this particular account. This is what the numbers look like. We don't know which is correct. So since more information is not available, we have not classified this. But nevertheless, in our opinion, this needs to be further looked into. Right, that one line needs to be further looked into at HO and leave it. At least you have passed the buck to the next man, then let them look at it. Now th these are again another couple of cases, I'm running out of time, I think I have only less than half an hour more, so I'll, I'll be a little faster here. Instances where creditors are not deducted, that's another case. How can you say that for drawing power computation, creditors need not be reduced? And they said that in the, in the sanction letter, we are not talking about creditors. But is that acceptable? When you talk about networking capital is what DP is, end of the day, minus the margin. And you say that you've taken debts and you've taken uh, your inventory and, and uh, your other current assets, loans and advances, everything taken. And you don't reduce your current liabilities or at least your current liabilities are related to your purchases, unpaid stock. No, that we have not reduced. The moment you reduce that, your DP is gone, it becomes NPA. So then you have to do it. Because the bank has been doing it like this 30 years, we have done like this, all the eminent auditors before you have accepted it. No, none of that is makes sense to us. Maybe the eminent auditors before us didn't see it. But fact remains, we have seen it, and how can you accept it now? So that's, that's another uh, example here. Now this is a case where balance in the account as on the last date is 95 lakhs, whereas as per audited accounts 27 lakhs, again uh, in line with what I, what I told you last time. And then there is also this whole inspection. So now when you, they go for inspection and there is a third figure which comes, now that also has to be considered. So you, in case all these figures are sh showing huge differences, small differences, 10%, 12%, 15% understandable. We can say it's judgment, assessment, non-moving, obsolete. We can explain it one way or other, we are all auditors, so that's fine. Small differences we can all understand practically. 
But then, in inspection you go, it's one figure, and in your financials it is only half of that, and in your stock statement it is twice as much as that. You can't really accept that, can you? So there again, if you are unable to classify, at least report. Anyway, I have a few cases, I'll, I'll skip the next slide. And this one again, now on consortium advances, I'm not going to read out the example which I've shown, but consortium advances, please understand that because it is a consortium advance, the, then the responsibility is only on the lead bank. My bank or the branch which I am auditing is, is, is not the lead bank. So lead bank sends some statement and it says according to that 12%, so I will take 12% as the branch's share, irrespective of whatever that statement is. 12% is assigned to us. No, we don't need to accept that. We need to question that. We need to look at that. We, we, again, we need to call for the financial statements and rework it based on the financials and see whether 12% as computed this way and 12% as per our computation is going to match. If it doesn't, then it is to be treated like any other regular advance. Just because it is consortium, they say lead bank is classified, it is performing. So, trust me, you find out. Any manager you go or any branch you go, you know clearly it is NPA based on everything in this bank, 90 day norm or even if it is a clear case of an NPA as per the branch which you do, their first argument will be, but what to do sir, lead bank has shown it as performing. Immediately a fax will come from the lead bank, we have classified it as performing. So they have classified it as performing, maybe it is performing there. We don't know, we are not, uh, we don't have access to the account activity with the lead bank. We have the account activity with our branch and here it is an NPA, classify it as an NPA, simple. We don't really need to look at what the lead bank is doing and all that. Nowhere, it is, it's not, there is no, no RBI or uh, master circular or any advice or notification which says that we need to rely on the lead bank's classification and all that. Okay, I'll skip the next slide on DP. Uh, why I brought in five, six, seven cases in DP is because that is where we have the largest quantum of issues. In any bank branch audit we do, the maximum NPAs we classify come as a result of DP mistakes or DP, the way in which they do it and the way in which it should be done. That gap results in NPAs substantially. And in every branch we do, at least three, four cases we find, from the smallest to the largest. There has not been a single case where we've gone to a branch and found that there are no NPAs at all. It is impossible, is what I would say, no doubt. If your audit team comes to you and says, sir, there are no NPAs, then they have not really looked at it in the way they should. Is that can be the only conclusion. Moving on, agricultural advances, very, very risky. Sector is risky. The whole collection mechanism is risky. The norms itself are risky. Given a longer term for it, an extended term and all of that, it's not like the regular 90-day norm. All kinds of problems. In the name of agricultural advances, entrepreneurs take in. In a particular bank where we went, there were accounts in the name of the wife of the branch manager. Five or six uh, agricultural advances for which there was no repayment for almost three years. In some documentation in Vyas, they said some crop, there was a problem, there was some, they've interpreted some circular of RBA which says for some specific crop, if there is, if there is a drought which happens in some other state, then they are given another two years extension. I was interpreted all of that. If an extension is given for this crop in Orissa, that means based on something, something it is applicable here and all that. So, which is all <laughs> beyond our uh, things, beyond what we can accept. So, go through the agricultural advances. It may be small. Why I brought this up is because from a materiality perspective, when you look at a branch, it may not figure in the top 10 accounts or top 15 accounts. But look at this as a separate segment, at least a few cases. Understand so that you bring out the weaknesses and say, we've looked at 10 cases, and according to us, out of 10 that we've checked, four are NPA. We don't have the mechanism and wherewithal to do 100% verification. But there is a problem. At least so much. At least disclaim that we are unable to express our opinion on agricultural advances. Simple. So many cases you will see. By and large, agricultural advances are not taken by the farmers. It will be taken by the zamindar. You will see agricultural uh, crop loans being used for buying tractors and whatnot. For some of us who would have been involved in the agricultural debt waiver audit, you know, a huge debt waiver that happened a couple of years back and when we went around doing the, the audit for the debt waiver, all kinds of things. 
it's not really the poor common farmer who is benefited as a result of this and uh, so then we have that responsibility to at least look at it as a segment and at least comment on the systems and controls we cannot say that we have ignored it because all cases are below 5 lakhs and all of that another risky area pre shipment post shipment advances packing credit etc heavy in terms of risk the way i see it high risk area and many a time we don't really know how to do this we must accept this most of us here don't really know how to do this because it is not like the conventional 90 day where you cycle and all that you know so this is something which requires some degree of learnings if it is to be done and if you don't know how to do it and if we don't know how to do it let us learn how to do it let us understand it may be different for each scheme how it works how what is this devolvement sometimes it may be unfunded limit so it may not even appear in the books funded limits are there unfunded limits will not appear in the name of the party it will be through some other general ledger account we generally look at the advances we may not really be doing a ledger scrutiny like we would for a regular statutory audit but this packing credit accounts may be lying somewhere else not in the advance accounts so we need to understand where is it parked it may be different in each bank and then understand the system how are these lcs being monitored how are these lcs being rolled over is it a 180 day norm at the on the 179 day they roll it over for another six more months since roll over is permitted but now it's clear you can't keep doing that your roll over becomes restructuring second restructuring it's npa are we doing that we we'll see that in every bank you will see four or five years there could be you know things which are kept which are being rolled over because that is more from an rbi perspective or a fema perspective where 180 days being looked at not because of np and all that but they'll be rolling it over and then they'll continue to show it as uh, as a performing asset that's not correct but there we'll have to bring in more procedures for verification i'm not getting into what those procedures are but if there is a consistent delay if there are devolvements in the account then that's something then that that's the red flag everything is going okay fine but if there are you see that there are some devolvements and you know excessive rollovers happening then you need to look at that account with more seriousness and see whether this can be or needs to be classified couple of cases again we are fresh packing credit those are the examples that have given here the borrower has serviced the dues for the two quarters in the year through disbursement of packing credit so another fresh limit is given another fresh pre shipment or post shipment facility is given and this one has been adjusted against that it may be against another bill just because it is against another lc or against another bill does not make it a and an extension of the same facility it will still be a new facility so when new facility is given and the fund from the new facility is used to repay the old facility just when it is about to turn npa then it is evergreening as i talked about earlier so we need to be alert to these things which are happening these are not i'm not talking about some stray cases which happen in some random bank and all these are things which are happening in virtually every branch it's just that probably when we go there for only two or three days we are also in that mindset to finish it off and all that. if we have to actually sit down and work on it one week 10 days if we are doing a proper thorough job trust me each one of us here is competent to, to actually unearth all of these things and it can be quite exciting also if you once we get into our routine regular audits probably don't give us the same excitement and here uh, you know sometimes it does especially when you see some situation or see some problem and you are actually addressing it okay